going on. I've been in, I've been in this, uh, in the field of uh, human services for 20, over 20 years and basically uh, just, just supporting people um, to elevate to the best level that they can, that they can uh, elevate to, I would say. And it's been a pleasure because I feel like this is my calling. And it's, it's a great thing when you're doing something that you have a passion for, your calling, and you get, you, you're able to get paid for it. Um, but that's enough about me. We are excited to uh, be with these these ladies, these ladies that are, you know, um, magnificent. I will say, I mean, that magnificent three uh, ladies that we have the, the opportunity to learn from and, and hear from as well, um, and just their role and their role in how to support fatherhood uh, from their standpoint. And, and backgrounds are very in-depth um, and they're very unique uh, coming from each perspective. So we are geared to have a great time. Um, like I said, learn so much because you can, never, you can never know enough. So it's a great opportunity for us as two, two program leaders of fatherhood programs to allow the women to step in and give their you know, and give their viewpoints. So that just lets you know we're kind of intelligent because we understand that we, we're always going to need the women to support us. So uh, that's kudos to my, my brother Antoine. And I'm just happy to be, to be a part of it, be a part of this as well. Thank you. I appreciate you, Damone. Uh, you know, when we were thinking about putting this together and like, um, like Jamone said, we, we meet every other week, uh, myself and our, our colleague, Terry included, who's a fatherhood advisor, but we, we just knew we needed some extra flavor in the, um, in this work, uh, webinar today, today, you know, besides myself or somebody else. So we thought no other than, uh, Mr. Jamon. So just a little bit about me on a program manager, of Buffalo prenatal perinatal network, uh, where I serve under the leadership of Luann Brown, our CEO, our organization predominantly focuses on serving underserved women and children and men uh, throughout the city of Buffalo and the Erie County region. Um, and again, as Jamal mentioned, you know, we've had the opportunity of knowing and working with them um, in various capacities, but all really around supporting fathers and working with men. So we're just really uh, proud to be able to be involved in this line of work. Um, and then again, like you mentioned, even more so to be able to collaborate and invite uh, these uh, amazing women on today to talk about the importance of not only their roles as mothers and professionals, but also, you know, how, you know, their fathers may have had influence in their lives and how they relate to their husbands or significant others and things of that nature in order to uh, just have a better community, right, and, and build a brighter future for children and you know, those that they are connected to. So without further ado, we'll have, uh, we'll introduce our first panelist, Lenya Lewis. So I had the pleasure of meeting Lenya just a couple of years ago um, through uh, Univera Healthcare. And, you know, just immediately, you know, we just kind of clicked. And from there, she's introduced me to a number of different people uh, who, you know, are just really awesome over at Univera. Uh, so we're just really glad to have an opportunity to be in partnership with you. And she has recently uh, joined our board over here at Buffalo Prenatal. So we just thank you for that. Uh, we will give our panelists each a time to be able to introduce themselves. And if if everyone could please mute yourselves <laughs> until we get into the Q&A period, that would be great. Thank you so much. Uh, but Linda recently, or not recently, but received her master's degree in healthcare administration from Utica College in 2017. Okay, I think I'm back. <laughs> Thanks, Sherman. Uh, you know, but Linda, she, like I said, she received her master's degree in 2017 and spent the last almost nine years helping individuals and families uh, to get the health insurance and health care that they need. She is a proud uh, mother of an 11 year old and um, 
21 year old 13 year old and so forth oh i didn't even realize you had twins <laughs> so it just goes to show you i'm, I'm not that detail oriented but um, no really appreciate having you on a call today Lin Ye, and we're looking forward to hearing more from you at this time i'm gonna let uh jamon introduce our next panelist uh thank you again antoine so i have the pleasure uh to introduce uh Dr. Ashley Cross. Dr. Ashley Cross has, from what I'm reading, I'm pretty sure it's more, more to it than what I have the pleasure of, of reading here. Um, obviously, on the sharing on the screen, but just phenomenal work. Uh, started off in uh, Tulsa, Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, she established the first first girls' home in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Raised awareness in the city. Um, just basically in regards to um, girls in foster care and, and aging out. And basically, she's just um, uh, a great leader. Uh, and I'm like, like I said, I'm just excited to even, you know what I mean, to even be reading this. So as I read a little bit more and I was talking to Antoine, I discovered that um, her husband is uh, Melvin Cross, who I know uh, very, very... Uh, Dear, dearly, good friend. Uh, we went to school together in Buffalo. So now I know she she really got her stuff together. She married uh, to my main, one of my main men's Melvin. So salute to you, Ashley, on that. Outside of um, everything else, she currently uh, serves as the executive director of Generation Two. And she dedicates her life to working within, working in the community to build and sustain hope in children in foster care. Um, she is also, because I want to want to make sure I capture everything, um, she also uh, pastors alongside her husband, who I just mentioned, Melvin Cross Jr. at Glory House International. And they are raising three lovely daughters, Jordan, Harper, and Madison. So, and if I missed anything, I apologize, Dr. Cross, but we got a lot here, so I just <laughs> make sure I cover everything. <laughs> to you, Queen. Appreciate that, and and I'll just take a moment to introduce. Um, last but not least, Noel. Uh, really appreciate having you here. I've had the the opportunity and pleasure of knowing both you and your husband, Doctor Saint Bill, and and both of you really just been a tremendous blessing to not only. Uh, the organization Buffalo Prenatal, but to um, my life, my wife's life uh, as well. So we, you know, been able to to develop in a relationship over these past few years. So we really appreciate you. Um, but based on you know what we have have learned, you know, and and we don't have the information to hear about your family, but I'm, I'm sure you'll be able to share that. But Noel is an assistant professor at the uh, UB uh, University at Buffalo and the School of Social Work. And she conducts research on black female relationships with a specific focus on IPV or intimate partner violence and sexual health and well-being. Uh, and her ultimate research goal is to develop and evaluate culturally specific preventative interventions that support strong and positive intimate relationships among black people in America. And, you know, just to add to this here, you know, just again, on a personal note, both Noelle and her husband, uh, Dr. St. Bill, really have a heart for people of color and elevating them in various spaces. And that's something that, you know, you won't always see in the bio uh, because they live it out every day. And so we just really appreciate you again being on, being on this, this webinar or this call today. So without further ado, let's get into the conversation and hear more about you all because that's what's important today, not what Jamon and I are saying. <laughs> all right, so Sherman, if we could just put it on the speaker's view, that'll be great. Um, and and really quick, thank you so much for for those of you who are joining us today. Um, I see some familiar faces. Um, Mr. Allen from Rochester, and I'm sure there'll be a, there's other people on the call too. Our CEO Luann is on the call and so forth. So we just appreciate you all being on the call. But um, let's you know, go into, we'll allow you all, the panelists, to reintroduce yourself, kind of fill in the gaps of things that we missed and 
and more importantly, like your, your families, right? Like just kind of helping us better understand like your family dynamics and then we'll get into the questions. But let's let's start off with uh, Lingya, if you wouldn't mind, just kind of giving us a little bit more about your background and so forth. Hi, um, again, my name is Lenny Lewis. I'm actually originally from Los Angeles, California. I moved here with my oldest son, who's now 21. Um, I came here as a single parent, um, raised him up until he was about six years old and met my husband here, who was actually from Jamaica. And we met here in Albion, New York, um, had three children together. Um, my Next child is also a male. Um, his name is Jaden. He is 13 years old, going on 14. I have twin daughters, Brittany and Brianna, and they are 11 years old. Um, I grew up and, and when I was younger, I didn't know my dad. Like I knew who he was, knew what he looked like. I hadn't met him yet. Um, but once I did meet him, um, our relationship just grew. It seemed like we didn't miss a beat. Um, he's been in my life all of my adult life, um, half of my childhood. Um, and we have just this really great relationship, great connection. My mother raised my brother and I and um, probably majority of our lives by herself. Um, and we, you know, we have a great bond also. Um, the connection with me and my dad was kind of more so like, a lack of communication between my parents. I don't think that it was something that was intentional, but it was just, I grew up without him for, you know, a few years and, you know, just built a bond with him later. My oldest son, I decided to raise him by myself because I felt like um, I could provide him the best life possible. It was a struggle, but we got there. He's an adult now. He's very intelligent, um, great young man. Um, my younger three, you know, they're all in middle school, but, um, having their father in the home and having him raise my children with him and my oldest child has been really great. And just having that connection between my oldest son and my husband has been a really good um, situation. He's a great role model. Um, he's good influence on him and he wouldn't know anything different. They bonded immediately. Uh, I don't know if there was anything else I needed to cover in that, but that's pretty much how our household is set up right now. Yeah, no, that's that's great. No, thank you so much. Um, yeah, so if we can have Dr. Cross, if you want to just share a little bit more about yourself. Yeah, sure. Hi, everybody. I'm Ashley Cross. Um, I moved here to Rochester in 2016 uh, after living in um, Tulsa for about 10 years uh, previous to Tulsa actually grew up in uh, Denver, Colorado. And so um, growing up, uh, my, my passion still to this day is working with children and families that are in contact with the Department of Human Services. Um, I oversee an organization here called the Hub 585 that I founded two years ago when I started here um, and started what's called the Care Portal, which links um, children, who, children and families who are in contact with the Department of Human Services um, with local churches that can respond to their their needs and help stabilize their environments. Um, my passion from working for working with children in foster care is that I come from a long line of foster parents. Um, everybody in my family either has done foster care or does foster care. Um, my mother and my father uh, fostered for years together uh, before they separated when I was in high school and then divorced when I was in college. Um, my father has always been physically present in my life, um, but the emotional attachment, the emotional availability has not um, always been there. So I, um, I tell people all the time, I, I have an ACE score of eight, um, which really it, it, it is why I do the work that I do. And it's why I'm a huge advocate for hope. Um, and I'll talk more about that later, but hope being more of a science and not just a feeling um, because research definitely shows how hope can really buffer against ACEs. Um, and so uh, my, again, I, I have three children. Um, Madison is 10 months and teething and cranky. Um, I have a very bossy, I won't say bossy, a very um, strong willed and sh very strong strong and opinionated three-year-old toddler, um, Harper Lee Cross. Um, and if you're my friend on Facebook, you probably see lots of Harper's world because she kind of runs our world. 
And we have a 24 year old, um, Jordan, and Jordan actually aged out of the foster care system when she was 18 years old. I fostered her in Tulsa for a few years before I moved here. And then when I moved here, uh, my husband Melvin and I made the decision to invite her to be a part of our, our lives forever. And so um, Jordan is our oldest and Madison uh, is our youngest. Um, as was already said, I passed her alongside um, my husband, we have a growing church here called Glory House International, and I think pastoring only threw fuel to the fire um, to just my passion for families. Uh, I believe that strong families is, is the answer to strong communities. Um, so it just further kind of uh, ignited my, my, my passion for seeing families whole and healthy um, and children having the best version of their parents that they could possibly have. Um, so yeah, I'm excited to, to kind of hear from everyone else and to... Um, to be, be able to be involved for today. Thank you, thank you. Uh, last but not least again, um, Dr. Noel uh, St. Bill, if you could, you know, just reintroduce yourself. And also we'll, we'll start, Jamon and I will start with you in terms of like questions, uh, just because I <laughs> had a hiccup with um, Linya and I wanna give her some time to like look over the questions just just to be fair. So uh, we'll, we'll go there. And again, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself again. All right, great. So my name is Noelle St. Bill, assistant professor at the University at Buffalo. Um, with regards to uh, home life, my husband and I are coming up on our 11 year anniversary on June 21st. We have a five, well, soon to be five-year-old on June 12th um, at home. And then I also have two daughters, my husband's, um, my husband's biological daughters um, just turned 20. One's about to turn 21 tomorrow and they do not live with us. They live in Atlanta and I've been in their lives since they were four and five years old. Um, so definitely um, have gotten to, to be there to see them grow. Um, with regards to, so overall with my work that I do, it's focused on healthy relationships and um, specifically in the black community. And I think my interest comes from just growing up and then looking you know, around me. I come from a two parent household. My parents have been married over 40 years. Um, but, you know, with any relationships, there's ups and downs. And so I've gotten to witness the good and also gotten to witness some of the challenges. Um, also just had um, friends and family members, some people in intimate partner violence relationships, um, just watching. I grew up in a small town and um, many of children who were African-American around me, my friends um, were not in a two-parent household. And so I think I've just always been interested um, in relationships and relationship dynamics. And so that really just drives my research and drives everything um, that I do. And uh, like uh, Dr. Cross said, uh, I, I strongly believe like the solution to so many things in the black community is really focusing on how do we build up black families and how do we focus on and narrow in and strengthen um, black male female relationships. So mm -hmm. that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. So yeah, so Jamon, I'll let you start because I feel like I've been talking too much uh, with, with the first question for Noel. And that's why I'm your co-host, man. So you don't have to feel overwhelmed, man. That's why we work together. You my man, Antoine. So don't, don't you don't have to act like that. <laughs> Appreciate you. <laughs> so Dr. Noel, greetings, Queen. It's, it's a pleasure for you to be in the building just for me. Um, no problem. What, what memory do you carry with you of your father from childhood that makes you appreciate his presence now that you are you are you are an adult. So I think there's so many memories, but I think to summarize um, the memories that stand out is my father is playful, um, but also my father is protector. 
And so when I was just thinking about this question, all sorts of memories started coming back to just, you know, playing certain sports with my father or just the way that he would always kind of, you know, play around. And I think one of the memories that stuck out the most is when I was having a sleepover and had my cousins over um, one night and we're up talking in my room and we start hearing like scary voices coming through the vent and we're, you know, we're eight, nine years old trying to figure out what in the world is that and we're getting scared. And then like, you know, father let it go on a little way too long. Like by that time we were like frightened, like what is going on? <laughs> I'm laughing like, ha ha ha, got you. And so it was things like that throughout childhood that, you know, just stand out to me. Um, but also that protector role. My father wasn't really big on showing emotions, um, but he showed that he cared in other ways. And I think, um, one of the ways was the things that he did behind the scenes. And so I remember a time um, when I was in high school, I played sports and played basketball and my um, basketball coach, I had gotten a new basketball coach who had previously coached my older brother. And so he was known for being a pretty tough, you know, stern coach. And I remember one of the days after practice, like he had kind of like exploded and went off on me. Um, and I remember going home and telling my parents and no reaction from my father. I'm like, all right, does he even care? Do you hear what I'm saying? Um, but I remember my older brother telling me like a couple of days later, like, you know, dad went up to the school, right? Like, you know, he had to talk with the coach. Like, and so, and basically he told him like, it's one thing for you to coach that way with my son. My son's got that personality where he needs that. He can handle that. But my daughter is a different person. That's a different personality. And like, don't you ever speak to her that way again. Um, and he never spoke to me that way again. But like my father never said anything about it, would never bring it up. But it was things like this that I would hear behind the scenes that always, you know, reminds me, my dad is there and he's got my back, so. Yep. That's, and that's wonderful, great. And it sounds like, I don't know your dad, I don't have the pleasure of knowing your dad, but it mm -hmm. sounds like dad is, he's very old school because that's an old school way of doing things. Yeah. Um, no, no lights, camera action, but listen, um, my man, let me holler at you real quick. Uh, let me talk to you about my baby girl. And, yep. and, and him, your dad and the coach know exactly how that conversation went. <laughs> so, you know, like I said, it just sounds like, you know, he, that's that's an old school presence, um, a old school parent presence, I, I, I would say, um, yep. to have. So that great memory, great memory on that. Thank you. So we got to, you want me to go to the next one, Antoine? Uh, well, I just want to touch on, I just want to add to what you said in regard okay. to Noel's response, because, you know, I think that oftentimes uh, when we think about fathers as being protectors, it's like more often than not like physical, right? Like somebody tries to break in or do something crazy, then it's like you have to physically protect. But I think, you know, in that regards, it's like, even emotionally, right? Boys and girls, right? Probably more so our girls, right? Um, but it's like protecting their emotional well-being and just understanding that men, like we interact a certain way. So like, <laughs> I, I think, I think I just think that it's so deep. But then I also think about those young ladies who didn't necessarily have that kind of father or father at all for that for that matter right to be able to have those conversations you know and so for those men out there who are coaches or whatever just kind of knowing intuitively or learning the difference between okay this is how you know I should interact with the young boys and not that you you're you're trying to like one is better than the other but you know just being aware that not everybody's going to receive the, you the same way and being able to adjust to that. So I, I really like what you share for sure, uh, Noel. Uh, so the next question is, how has the success you experienced today in your career, your marriage and motherhood been impacted through, as a direct result of the relationship that you had with your father? I think it's been impacted in every way. I think the number one way is just having that model um, and going back to, I, I had um, my, my father in the household, have that relationship with him, still have that relationship with him. And so I got to see a model of what a father looks like, um, what a husband looks like. 
um, the model that I spoke about with my parents being married 40 plus years. And so a model of, you know, what a relationship looks like, um, the goods, the bads, the ups, the downs. Um, and I saw, so, so I think what my father showed me and, and what's mirrored, I know my husband says all the time and it probably, you know, gets on his nerves as I'm always like, you're doing something that reminds me of my father. That reminds me of my father. Huh, that's like, you know, and, and so I think unconsciously, it's even, it's really selecting your mate, right? And looking at those characteristics um, that I so admired in my father growing up and seeing and not even recognizing when selecting a mate that I selected a mate with many of those same and similar uh, characteristics. And, and so I think that's one of the number one things that unconsciously the modeling um, has, has, has um, really, <laughs> really determined who I choose, how I interact with in a relationship. Um, how to communicate with my husband, kind of seeing that communication between my parents, my mom and my dad. Um, and so I think just having that model of a relationship was probably one of the greatest gifts um, that I could ever get. And having that model also of what a father is supposed to be. Um, and I think, and I guess I'm actually going probably in more into another question, but I think um, it was important to me, one of the things that I realize now as a parent is to kind of recognize and realize the role of father, because as I, um, like I said, my stepdaughters did not live with me and having my first biological child in my home, I, you know, I'm this mother bear, that's, you know, my child and kind of having a back up and create room to allow my husband to also, you know, father this child and kind of go back to childhood memories of, well, if you don't let him do this and you don't let him like look at all the, you know, many roles my father has played in my life. And so I think early on when my son was born, that was probably one of the hardest things for me to do. Um, but I think it's constantly remembering like you got a different relationship with your mom versus your dad and it's okay. And so the same thing now that you're a mother, allow and don't, you don't necessarily have to control everything that goes on with that. Okay, he may not have changed the diapers, right? He may not have, you know, read the right bedtime story. He may not have, you know, whatever else, you know, it's more so when he was younger, but give him that space to be a father. And I think having my own father uh, in my life has reminded me of that. So um, with regards to my career, I think just watching my my parents have they I feel like they 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 follow their dreams. Um, they both work. They my parents got married at a young age, 17, 16, 17, 17, 18. So they've been you know very young age. They were still kids themselves. Um, got jobs early on, kind of worked their way, stayed at their jobs um, up until you know retirement. But also have done things on the side with regards to following their dreams. So they have their own car business together. They're into real estate. Um, together. And so I think just watching them do that and then kind of watching again, that kind of unconscious modeling, like my husband and I were both in uh, the same field, social work. There's a lot of things that we do together, um, career rise and just learning how to work with your partner in a work setting. I think, again, that was something that was modeled to me by, by my watching my mom and dad that I'm able to do that um with my husband and so just that overall his overall presence has set a model for my marriage for myself as a mother and for my career so yeah wow that's really powerful i, I want to let you jump in here jamon but um you know one of the things that we we talk about in the group uh, you know two things that you said well one of the things you said i never we've never put it this way but you said you had to like you had to like learn how to give your husband space to be a father. I think that that's so profound. I, you know, I, you know, I have a young daughter, um, Isabella, and you know, so I like throw her in the air and do things. And my and Simone doesn't know it's like that stuff, right? But but it, but it's different, and it's it's the way I relate to her. As she gets older, I'll do things to to relate to her that Simone, my wife, may not do. Um, but there's a lot of significance and value in that to, to your point. And then the other thing you, you talked about as it relates to your career in terms of like watching how your, your parents moved and work together. We, 
this this quote is from Rachel Cruz, who says more is caught than taught. And, and we talk, we say that a lot in our groups because we really believe that our children will learn a lot more from how we live our lives than what we instruct them on doing, right? Better, for better or worse. And so again, thank you so much for, for sharing those points. Uh, Jamon, did you want to jump in and you know add anything and then maybe go to the next question? Thanks, Antoine. Yeah, I, 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 the response was powerful in the whole one. I'm pretty sure, just like Antoine, we all kind of had things that we, we took away from the response. One of the things I took away was the the modeling that you picked up on um, from your from your dad um, that was done purposely, and um, it, it it it's nothing more pleasing to a parent to know based off their children's success that they were listening and they were paying attention. So that's, that's you know, again, just reflecting back on what we do as um, um, fathers who run fatherhood programs, it gives us, you know, that much mo more motivation to continue doing what we do and just, and, and know that it, it's resonating. And these kids are like sponges um, and we are, night and day role models to you know what they're seeing and as Antoine you know so elegantly put it you know basically the really you are the more beneficial it is going to be for your child you know what I mean because they're going to watch more than more than more than they're going to listen they're going to watch and you lead by example so I, that's one of the things that kind of just stood out you know what I mean because you just really couldn't shake that as you just said like I've just found myself really, you know, identifying what what I what I, the values that I grew up on, and that's what I wanted for my king, and that's just that's powerful in itself. So I just wanted to say, you know, kudos to 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 your response on that. Um, and we're on question three, correct, Antoine? Yes, sir. All right. Just want to make sure. I want to make sure you awake. You good? <laughs> I'm all right. I'm all right. All right. All right. <laughs> when you think of when you think about and see your husband's involvement with your child, son, what are some some initial feelings and hopes for your child and husband, and why? Lifelong relationship. That's why. And just I look at and they said my my son's about to be five. He's at that stage, you know, where daddy is hero. Like. I want to be exactly like daddy. I want to dress like daddy, talk like daddy, whatever daddy's doing. Um, that's what I want to do. And so just watching them and also watching my husband um, grow into being a father. As I said, we've got, got my stepdaughters. They did not live with us. And so some things had to shift. I think having a child that, you know, is here in our home um, every day. And my, my husband did not have, his father was in the home, but sometimes you're in the home and you're not present. So his father was in the home, but he was not, you know, physically present. And so my husband having to go into that relationship um, with my child and the difference that I've seen from, you know, day one to now my child being almost five and my husband does a lot of work with like masculinity and so a lot of it has been challenging right his own masculinity like okay does he have to toughen up can he not cry can he not and so seeing some of that early on where now that my child is you know our kid our son is growing about to be five um, the other day, my son is crying and my husband turns around and come here. It's okay to cry. Like you can cry, let it out, let it out. And so uh, ju just seeing this shift um, and seeing this growth in their relationship and seeing a, a space where my son is allowed to be emotionally vulnerable with his father and that like, that is okay, you know, as a young boy. And so looking at all of the messages that he's getting early on, again, that modeling as a man just really makes me extremely happy and extremely excited um, for my son, specifically knowing that, that my husband did not get that. Um, and, and so I think my greatest hope, you know, life isn't promised. My greatest hope is that they have this lifelong relationship. I sit back sometimes and just picture, you know, when my son has grown and what his and my husband's relationship will be like and, you know, really feel warm 
about my son being able to call on his father, knowing that my husband can't call on his father, you know, right now as an adult. And so I think those are my greatest hopes. I'm also, you know, with knowing that tomorrow's not promised, I take a lot of pictures, I document everything. Um, and so my son, you know, will always know, if God forbid something happened, you know, to his father tomorrow that I was loved. Like there's picture, my husband always says, I think I tell him, do I tell him I love you too much? Do I kiss him too much? I'm like, there's no such thing as saying I love you too much. There's no such thing as, you know, kissing him too much. And so I know my son will always be able to, you know, look back on that and say, yeah, it was love. My father always showed me like affection, was always kissing me, told me I loved me like a hundred times a day. Like he's probably tired of it already at age five. Um, and so just that, that, that strong relationship is my greatest hope when I look at my uh, husband and my son. Wow. Thank you. That, I mean, right, right, Antoine. <laughs> I mean, for, for me, real quick, before I, you know, before I give you this no look pass, Antoine, um, is just how, how parenting is so universal. And when I, what, what I mean when I say that is that you have to embrace the growth um, that comes with parenting because there's no right or wrong. There's just growth. Now, how you move from that growth depends on, obviously, the, the foundation, but there is growth. There, there, and one of the key words that Dr. Noel said that kind of stuck out is relationship. It is a relationship. You are being, you have to relate to someone else, regardless of the, the nature of the relationship being a parent to a child, you still have to relate and vice versa. So you guys are growing together and that's just phenomenal. And you could tell based off the question I asked, you know, before I even really finished the question, you just started glowing. So that was, you know, I pay attention and stuff. I'm like, oh, she is all the way in. So, you know, uh, for me, it was, a, it was a, again, a, a powerful answer to a, a real powerful question. Antoine. Yeah, no, this is this is good. This almost reminds me of our fatherhood groups. Really, it's just better because we don't always get to interact with the moms and hear your perspectives and and so forth. So I want well, I want to say better. I don't want the fathers out there to get mad. It's just it's unique. It's different. You better, <laughs> um, you, you, better you better come back and say something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I had to clean that up. You better clean that up because I, <laughs> I see a couple people in the chat box on me right now. Mm -hmm. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah no uh just to echo what jamon shared i yeah i really like that uh you know the lifelong relationship i actually you know dr chris and i were just together yesterday and uh, we've been working on this project together doing um early childhood work like fathers engaged in early childhood so i've you know we obviously you guys have shared kind of videos with me and pictures and so forth um and, and we're just trying to really highlight more of those relationships that are being cultivated, like the one that Chris has with, with your son. I mean, you know, and then normalizing that, that love that he shows uh, your son and so forth, because like you said, and like Chris's experience, he didn't get that. And even um, Dr. Ashley mentioned just the emotional unavailability of fathers, how they can be physically present, but emotionally absent, right? I mean, and that's, really significant in and of itself um, whenever that happens. But, uh, with, you know, not to believe, I want to make sure that our other panelists get a chance to, to go in. And I know we're coming up um, almost a, a quarter or two. Uh, but so for men who are fathers who've witnessed IPV, intimate partner violence, and domestic violence as a child, uh, what are some suggestions that you have for them now, now that they are adults and they want to raise healthy families, but they might still be dealing with some of that trauma from when they were a child and they really don't want to repeat the same mistakes that their fathers made but as all of you know most of you on a call know we you know more often than not repeat some of those things that we say we'll never do so can you talk to us a little bit about that first i would say that you're not destined to repeat these mistakes 
Um, and so knowing that you're not destined and if you, I think the number one key is recognizing, right? And so being aware of the trauma that you experienced um, early on, being aware of how it impacted you and also seeking out back to the modeling, seeking out other models. Like there's households that we're born into that we don't get the choice, the option, but now as adults, we can seek out other models and other ways of what healthy relationship looks like. And so it could be joining fatherhood groups to see what does it look like, you know, to be a healthy, um, to be a father, um, joining relationship groups, learning more about what a loving, healthy relationship entails, being open to counseling, being open um, to getting help. And so I think the number one thing is just looking for other models, recognizing that you may not have had the most perfect model, that there may be something, maybe that's all you know, but that's not where it stops. Right. And, and so just seek out, seek out, be open to receiving um, help. And I think once you're open, once you're open to receiving help, once you recognize it, I think that puts you in a good place. I also am going back to my husband. I mean, he came up from, um, in an abusive household, but he came up with the out with the perspective of, you know, this is everything I don't, you know, want to be, but also very reflective. Um, of when some of those attitudes and behaviors um, or anger, like very just overall self-assessment, very reflective. Um, and, and so I would say self-awareness is probably the key um, to starting that change. And then from the self-awareness, get, getting help and all the help that you can um, to help you be a successful husband and father or partner. Mm -hmm. no, that was great. That was great. I, I don't know about you, Jamal. Hopefully you're not asleep over there. I can't see your camera, but um, the, <laughs> the I like, you know, you're not destined. I mean, that in and of itself is really significant. You don't have to re repeat the same mistakes. I mean, one of the other things that you said was really significant was, you know, about being reflective and self-aware. I too grew up in a household where my, my father was verbally abusive, um, really. And, and then, you know, at times was physically abusive. And, you know, just being aware of that, I have to be aware of the way that I interact with my wife today. So, you know, that is, that is really important. Um, again, just to uh, keep us moving forward, we want to go to our next panelist, um, Ashley. Uh, Dr. Dr. Ashley, we just want to, um, you know, just go, yeah, go through a couple of questions too with you. And uh, then our last panelist will be um, Linya, but Jamon, I'll let you take over from here. Thank you, Antoine. Okay, Dr. Ashley Cross, again, it's a pleasure. Tell, tell my guy I said hello. Um, tell him Jamon said, what's going on? Um, I'm gonna dive right in. As a, hope, <clears throat> as a hope giver yourself, how can fathers learn to build a house of hope for their families, particularly those who have children who have come out of foster of a foster care of the foster care system. Yeah, so I think the first thing is um, really properly defining hope. Um, I think sometimes, definitely, when we're talking uh, about feelings, emotion, spirituality, hope is kind of this ambiguous concept. You feel hope for, you feel hopeless. Um, but it's actually a science. There's a lot of, there's a growing body of literature on the science of hope. Um, and so that's the first thing is realizing, you know, it's just not a matter of how you feel, but it's, a, it's actually hope in action. It's what we do with how we feel. And so um, I think the first thing that we can do is understand or what fathers can do is understand um, that as a father, it's your, it's your job to lead your children from their present um, situations to their future. Um, and it, that doesn't even stop at being 18, you know, or aging out or being 18 years old, becoming an adult. And so I always talk about um, there's a formula for hope, right? So hope is actually goal setting um, plus agency thinking, which I like to say is giving voice. It's having your young child believe that their voice matters, that they have autonomy over their situations um, and that you hear them, right? And that, that they, they have a perceived capability. So not only can I set a goal, but I actually believe from my heart of hearts that I can actually achieve the goal that I set, that's, that's agency. Um, and then also helping them uh, uh, develop pathways thinking, which I say is uh, build, uh, you know, building bridges, right? And that's between where they are now and where they wanna be. Um, fathers really have to understand that you are uh, typically the first, you and the mother are the first hope givers that that children, that your child will ever experience. Um, and we see that children go from 
a life of being applauded over every little thing, right? Like my daughter can 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 burp and, and I'm like, oh, that's so cute. Um, to once they get enrolled in school, it's criticized for everything, right? Your scores were not high enough. You know, you didn't you didn't do well in your basketball game. You only had three assists and six points, you know, and you start criticizing everything. Um, and so, you know, making sure that fathers understand like children at every age deserve to be praised for every accomplishment, no matter how big or how small you perceive it to be. Um, and so uh, just some practical things, obviously, uh, creating a culture in your house that is centered around goal setting, right? And it's not, it's not about achievement. It's not everything is it about like either you, you, you've achieved something or you have failed, but it's about kind of putting that, that well, one, goal setting really helps for your child to know that you believe that they can do something. It's not just about them, but it's like, hey, man, so I, I know that, you know, you got to you got to be a B, which is really, really good. But let's aim for something better because I know what's in you. Right. Um, and so it's that goal setting. And, um, and and also parents or fathers can really um, do everything that they can in their power to establish and protect trust. Um, trust is huge. Consistency is huge. If you say you're going to do something, do it. Um, my dissertation work was around how hope is impacted through the lived experience of foster care. And I had an opportunity to give boys in foster care, it was all boys, um, in foster care survey. And I pulled out my highest ho hope scoring boys and my lowest hope scoring boys, and I interviewed them. And the major theme was consistency and trust. That is what, that is what either impeded on their hope um, or increased their hope was, I believe that the, that the adults in my life, they actually believe that I can do what it is that I say I can do. And when I experience some sort of goal blockage, they help me pivot, right? They don't just give up on me, but they help me figure out another way to accomplish that goal. Um, I shared a little bit earlier, I have a hope score. Of, I mean, I have a an ACE um, score of eight. And there's also a hope score and I have a hope score of 64, which right now it's, it's fluid, right? So I could be 64 today and I could be a 50 tomorrow. It's it, hope is fluid, it's always changing. Um, and so when we're talking about establishing a, a culture of hope within your home, it's using that language, is asking your child, where did you see hope today? You know, um, what makes you hopeful? You know, where where did you feel like um, today you were disappointed and how can I help you? What what do you need from your father? How can I support you and what it is that you're trying to, um, to accomplish? So everything is centered around goal achievement. Everything is centered around um, partnering with your child to help them with whatever it is um, that they're setting out to do. Because like I said, fathers really are those primary hope givers. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Ashley. That is, you know, what I like about the responses you just using hope. It's a very simple word, but it's, it's so much centered around hope. And as you stated, it, it, it's hope. It can, it's so in depth. And um, if you guys are paying attention, I, I'm, I'm, I'm all in uh, Dr. Ashley's background. She got don't stop until you're proud. So again, um, I pay attention to the surroundings because like you said, you have to create that culture. So hope stood out for me in culture um, because these are the things that we, we, when I say we, I'm talking about representing that, that fraternity of fathers that we kind of, we live on. We want to change the culture and we hope that we can do it to the best of our ability. So those words kind of go hand in hand. So um, Antoine, I don't know if you had anything to piggyback on yeah, I'm sitting here trying to write down notes and I, then I'm like, I'm glad we were recording this because, <laughs> because you know, I can't can't keep up. Um, but no, I mean, the last thing that you said was really, I mean, you know, for me, you know, just hit home. You know, we always talk about fathers being, well, we don't always talk about them being a primary caregiver. They're usually a secondary caregiver is what, we, what people talk about. Um, but just the thought about them being a primary hope giver, how powerful is that? um to to say uh, you know how wh what kind of things does that impact later on as it can as it are consistent in doing that one of the guys that trained me in the fatherhood field reggie cox he's actually from the father um rochester area too um but he he talks about how consistency over time builds trust um and and what you were, were just speaking about made me think about that but uh i i don't want to uh i want you to keep flowing i don't want to say too much so i'll let you Appreciate that, brother. Appreciate that. So, Dr. Ashley, obviously, again, for the sake of time, I'm going to try to give you two-part questions, if that's okay. Um, I don't want to overwhelm you or, or hit you with no surprises. 
So too often men feel insecure about raising girls because they don't know what to do. What advice can you provide for fathers or male caregivers with, with that will aid them in fathering girls and young ladies? And also raising, helping raising girls that helping them become confident and well-respected women to help them be secure in their identity and outlook on life? Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a really good question. Um, I am a huge advocate for searching within yourself for anything that could stop you from loving deeply, right? We're talking, I'm talking about spouses, children, anything that stops you or prevents you from loving the people who matter most deeply. Um, and a lot of times men and mothers and fathers need to go to therapy. They need to, they need to really talk to a professional, um, and deal with their own trauma so that they're not exposing their children to the dysfunctions, the things that have made them dysfunctional, right? Or the things that made it hard for them uh, as children and growing up. And so I think that that's one of the first things is to deal with anything that hinders you from a deep connection with your daughter. Um, Daughters need to feel like their, their fathers are not just physically present, but also, like I said earlier, emotionally available um, because fathers really are a source of their child's identity. I've, as, as an adult, um, I, have, I have a roller coaster of a relationship with my father. And even still to this day, um, after a lot of work, I am able to pull out the great things about my dad. Like it's not all bad, right? Like there are some things that he did and he taught me that it's, it's a piece of who I am. And I, and I wouldn't, it wouldn't be me if it wasn't for Daryl Walker Sr., right? And so that had to come through my own work, but that came from the fact that I was like, I don't want my daughters to not feel like they're able to emotionally connect with their mother because I've put up this wall based off of the man that I was, I was raised by. Right. So I had to like see, I had to, I had to come to grips with some of the things that would stop me from loving my spouse as deeply as I need to and my daughters. And so I think that that's one thing that men can do is, is one, find a therapist, find a network of, 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 of men who speak the same language, who understand the importance and the significance of fatherhood, be, be open and willing to ask questions. And ask your daughter questions. Once they get old enough, ask them, like, how am I doing? Like, you know, what do you need from me as a father? Like, and that's something that definitely within the black community, we don't, we don't teach that. Like, you don't, you know, I'm not gonna ask my child if I'm doing good as a parent. Like I'm parenting them, I'm the parent, right? But they they know how they feel. And I know one thing that I've never been able to do, even still to this day, I could never tell my father he hurt my feelings. Like it just, it's not a productive conversation. And so for me, that's something that I tell my husband, like, hey, we always want to leave room for our daughters to say, daddy, that hurt, you know, that hurt my feelings. And for you to respond with empathy and compassion and ask questions. Um, and so to me, that's, I think that that's one of the biggest things is that men and women, but we're talking about men today, men really need um, to do a lot of soul work to know, you know, what are those things, those pain points that I need to confront so that I can love my daughters deeply and be available for them. Thank you, Dr. Ashley. Very, <clears throat> very well put. One thing, things that stood out from that answer, like you were talking about uh, what we do when you said having that support system of men, and that's the fatherhood program, uh, Antoine. Um, that's what we do. And and just the, the fact that Dr. Ashley is kind of just co-signing that just, you know, supports what we do even more. So that was a quick little marketing segue I'm going to use. You know what I mean? Thank you, Dr. Axe. just want to talk about. I'm going to send you, send me your address and let me send you a shirt. You know what I mean? But um, the reflecting piece of being able to um, understand where you came from to better support you on where you're going. I think that kind of put a, 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 a spotlight on what we as parents and most importantly as fathers need to take away you know and understand like you know like you said leaving that room for for the children to say you know what yeah man you come on and and not feel not take it personal because we can't give constructive criticism to the child and we don't want them to take it personal and not be able not be able to wear the other the other shoe so I, I feel like um, highlighting that um, that reflection piece is major because that's 
really significant in, in once again, the growth. And going back to a word that you use in the, in the first question, culture, changing the culture changing the culture and it just and that's and that's always going to kind of ring bells in in the back of my mind so for me that's what kind of stood out and once again powerful answer to a really in-depth question it was a two-part too i threw some curveballs at you you know i knew you can handle them though uh antoine you 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 up man no this is good this is good we do apologize, but not really in advance because we will go over. For those of you who had to jump off at three o'clock, that's perfectly fine. We're recording this, so we'll make sure you get a copy of the recording. But we, we're going to, you know, kind of move forward and make sure that uh, we give Miss um, Lingan Lewis a chance to, to chime in. But just before I get to that, um, again, but just really uh, a really powerful response. Uh, one of the things that you said, you're talking about the father as a source. One of uh, uh, the late Miles Monroe would, would describe a father as, you know, the source that provides, that protects, nourishes, and provides an identity for that which he produces. And um, I think that that is so powerful. And it, and, and it goes missing a lot of times when we talk about fatherhood, just how fathers play a role in shaping the identity of their children and how um, impactful that that becomes to be both now and later on. So again, all of you, please look out for us to be reaching back out to you for our conference in the fall, because we want to definitely bring you all back uh, just to continue this. But uh, without further ado, uh, Ms. Lenya Lewis, I want to, uh, you know, just ask you a couple of questions. Hopefully you, <laughs> you've had a chance to kind of look at some of them. Again, I deeply apologize for getting those to you so late and not, you know, realizing that, e you know, the email address, you know, changing that. So forgive me. No problem. Uh, but so the first question for you is, you know, so we've heard in it, and this is, you know, <laughs> This this question, I you know, I've heard my mother say it, my aunts, grandmothers, you know, various um, uh, female figures in my life who I, I deeply respect, but I, I challenge the thought where you know they would say, "Well, I'm both the mother and the father to you." I, again, I grew up raised predominantly by a single mother, and um, but more often than not, when my mom was you know kind of grinding it out and having to do things on her own, she was I'm both roles and I didn't understand till later on especially getting involved in this work um, along here with Jamone is that you know that's I don't necessarily think that that's true and so but but anyway it doesn't matter what I think I want to know what your thoughts are around that the line of thought um, that that moms or women are both the mother and the father can they completely fill that role so from personal experiences no I never you know I had my son for six years right before my husband came into the picture. And I didn't think that I could be both. I could be mom 2.0, but I cannot be mother and father. I can't raise him into the type of man he needed to be. Um, much like my mother couldn't show me male influence on her own. I needed my father to show me that. I needed to see a different perspective. So I don't agree. And I hear it a lot. I, I even start to hear from our generation of adults that I'm mom and dad. No, you're not mom and dad. You can play one role. You can be the greatest mom. You can be, you know, like I said, mom 2.0, but you cannot be a father figure to your child. You can just do the best that you can if the father is not active in the child's role, but they do need a male influence. They do need a father figure. And those words will never come out of my mouth. I don't mind just playing my role and figuring it out later, but on my end, like I was, you know, grateful to have my dad come in when he was there and see a different side of, you know, fatherhood. I was, you know, grateful that my husband stepped in and helped me raise my child and our boy together. Um, but I think that we need to get out of saying that just no more than a man can say, you know, a single father can say I'm mother and father. He's father. He's that influence. And that child, male or female, is going to need a mother's influence also. Yeah, wow, that that was loaded. Mom 2.0, never going to forget that one. Uh, we, we'll add that in the curriculum somewhere. But um, talk to us about solutions, right? Just to be a little practical here and, and to, you know, like Jamone 
you said earlier, I'm throwing a curveball at you because this wasn't in a question either. But what what can moms do? Because I know, you know, similar to what you described, Noel, you know, my mother's mama bear, you know, I couldn't go anywhere as a child. I was like, oh man, this, you know. <laughs> so, anyways, what can mothers do when they don't necessarily have the biological father involved to get a positive male role model involved so that they get some of that, you know male figure in their lives so what can they do so I mean other than having my father and in the past a stepfather I had um uncles you know um I had older cousins that were my mom age my mother's age but um so that would I would probably have that same influence my son had my brothers you know um and they played an active role in their lives and then you know, my husband came in. So, you know, when it's time to settle down, you got to kind of be picky about the type of men that you bring around your children. So my husband, you know, he was raised by a single mother. Um, he knew who his father was also, but he didn't have as much of an influence from a father's, uh, you know, relationship. But he, you wouldn't know that. You you wouldn't see that in my house. So you would think that he knew exactly how to do, how to be the type of father he is based on what he dealt with growing up. And I think that with him, it was the opposite. I think he saw what he didn't like in um, his parent, his father, and he decided to be opposite. So he's very active in our kids' lives, all four of them. Um, and he, you know, goes out of his way to be the best influence on all of them, you know, whether they're biologically his or not. Um, and I think that that helped, at least my oldest, that helps all of my children. But, you know, my father, my son, my oldest son decided that at a very young age, even speaking to his biological father on the phone, no, I got a new father and this guy is in my life. He's taking care of me, um, you know, without any influence of what I have felt, you know, I didn't say anything negative to my child about his, his other, you know, his real father, but he formed his own opinion. And no, no matter what I say, no matter how I tried to talk him out of it, the one thing that I grew up is ne um, around was never bashing any one of our parents. Um, none of my parents, none of my parents, step parents, anything like that would do anything like that. So I, you know, tried to make sure that I set the same example, regardless of how I grew up or what, regardless of what I know, what I've witnessed from either, even outside relationships. I just felt like any male in my family needs to be some form of an influence to my child, um, whether they have a bond with their biological father or not. So I think that my husband stepping in and being a father, even prior to us getting married to my oldest son, I think that was very helpful in his life. No, that's really good. Uh, Jamal, I want to give you a chance to chime in if you have anything. I know I have a couple of thoughts. No, I appreciate that, Antoine. So, um, Linnea, I just, just, just want to piggyback and off of, once again, the, the reflection, and I think it's just so powerful for you guys, to, for you ladies, I'm sorry, for you queens to be able to use um, and really apply your upbringing to what you do currently. Um, and it just shows, again, the growth of your parents, you know, really doing what they needed to do to put you um, on a path to be successful and you kind of coming back and kind of doing the same thing. And once again, I'm in, I'm in your world too, Linya. I see the phenomenal woman um on the back of you you know what I mean so I, I I'm, I'm digging that and the, the whole vibe and and I think um having those those uh visual because we are a lot of us are visual learners um we grasp towards things that um we see so having those things around I, I feel like just supports everything that we're doing today so once again just the reflection piece for me alone is is enough you you you've given a lot but that reflection piece it just stands out for me to be like man that's that's you know you're doing your thing queen just salute yes sir um yeah just you know a couple of 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 you know thoughts that i had you know one i i really appreciate what you said in terms of being selective i think that with good intentions for moms who are looking to you know get a positive male role model in there. Unfortunately, not everybody is who they say they are. And so it's like, man, you got to really kind of vet 
people out. I know even for me, even I, as I became a teenager, my mom wanted different men in the church to get involved in my life. And she was, she would start grilling them. And I'm like, oh, I, you know, I can't, <laughs> can't believe she would went there. But it's like, even people in the church, like, it doesn't matter. Like, you really have to get to know the people who you want to be in your, involved in your child's life, you know, not to like discourage that relationship, but it's like, you know, to learn as much as you possibly can about who they are um, and then how they will potentially influence your, your child, whether it's son or daughter, right? So now that's really good. I do want to give the folks in the audience a chance to ask questions. I know that I've, I've seen a couple of um, comments from Duell. Um, thank you for being here, by the way. But for any of you who have questions for our panelists, I want to give you an opportunity to jump in the conversation and so forth. I see Terry has his, <laughs> has his hand raised. Appreciate you, Terry. So yeah, good. jump right in. I ask um, whatever your question. First of all, uh, thank you, ladies, for um, being on the panel. Really appreciate it. Um, I have a couple of questions. One for Linya. If I, I hope I pronounced it right. But anyway, the question I have is, how did you work through whatever feelings that you might have had with your father not being there that allowed you to get to a secure place that you can get into a relationship right. with someone um, to be a father of your children? It's a two-part question. And the second one is, how did you help, if any, with your children to get to that same place? Um, so the, the thing with my, my parents was more so they just didn't communicate with one another. Um, my dad was there financially. He always wanted to be in the picture. You know, he was always welcome to be in the picture. It was just me personally not really understanding um, the situation and not understanding um, that all I need to do is you know, you want to meet your dad, you want to know your dad, like we could just pick up the phone and make a phone call. I didn't understand that at a very young age. So, um, so we lost some time there, but the relationship he and I have built, it doesn't matter. You wouldn't realize that there was any, at any point that he wasn't there. Um, he's a great father, great grandfather. Um, so that helped me because at the time that I felt I really needed him involved, he was there without, you know, hesitation. I called, hey, I want to, I want to see you. I want to meet you. I knew where he worked. Um, it was just a matter of calling and, you know, being around, you know, the house that he knew, you know what I mean? Because we didn't stay in the house that he knew us to be in. So when I got a hold of him, he came right there within like 24 hours, you know, and we built a relationship. So as far as my oldest son. He doesn't have a relationship with his father at all since he was four months old. And, um, you know, I gave him, I gave his father time to get to know him. Um, he didn't take that opportunity, at least the correct way. So then I moved my son out of a bad environment and moved him to Western New York. And even still, I tried to keep in contact with his father and say, hey, you can come out here whenever you want and visit. Um, you can see your son. It just never developed but then my son he I felt like he kind of picked my husband and said this is this is my dad now you know this is who's going to raise me and they built their own bond um just kind of helping my husband you know raise our kids together because you know this was his first time being a parent um also except you know my son was six years old when he started being his parent just kind of stepping back to and letting him kind of take some control because I was used to for six years at least doing it by myself, I had to step back and let him actually be the parent too. Because like I said earlier, I can't raise a man to be a man. I can't show my daughters um, how a man is supposed to be because I'm not a man, I'm a woman. And they need to see that their dad has input. They need to see that their dad loves them. Just like I saw both my parents love me regardless of whatever the situation was back then. And I will never blame any either one of my parents for any relationship that I did or did not have with either one of them because, you know, my mom was young, my dad was young, um, we learned, we live and learn and we, you know, we have our bond now and I make sure that my kids, you know, my husband, yes, he's in the house, but I try to make sure that he has a bond with his children as well. Oh, that's great. That's great. Uh, I hope that, that um, 
Terry, you, <laughs> you got your quite all of your questions addressed and so forth. That's really good. What, I do want to take one other question from folks, and then I, we're going to close out only because I, I really want to be respectful of everybody's time, and especially for our panelists who took the time out of their day to uh, be with us. One of the things that you said, though, Linda, Linda was um, it kind of reminds me, goes back to what Noel shared in terms of giving your husband space to be a father. And I think that's really significant in terms of the dynamics of the relationship. But does anyone else have a question before? Before we uh, close out today's session. Is that Dr. Wynn, did you have something? Yeah, so this is a uh, was great discussion. I learned a lot, especially we have uh, women here. Before we usually most just have that. So I definitely, I think uh, I heard a lot of new information. Um, yeah, I think uh, really is a teamwork, I would say. Um, <laughs> it's a teamwork for the whole family. <laughs> so yeah, that's my comment. Um, in terms of questions, I think uh, um, I think you guys uh, have a lot of uh, stories to share. Um, so to me, um, do you think, uh, um, I'm trying to think like uh, if we, um, apply why you guys uh, said it to the population. Do you think that we only uh, capture kind of uh, the most uh, situations or we, we miss some, you know, some people who represent their own uh, situations? Um, because especially we think about, you know, uh, Antoine, like the other fathers in our program, like uh, in terms of the, like socioeconomic or living environment, uh, I just want to make sure we get a full picture. Of yeah, no, that's a good point. I, I definitely think, I, I don't think that we, you know, we hit all areas today at all. Um, you know, we, we were really um, kind of specific in terms of some of the things that we cover. Is there anything in particular, though, that you will want to know more about or learn? Yeah, so... I see, I think, uh, you know, um, the four um, mothers here are pretty successful, I would say. Um, I'm thinking about, you know, say if, when you grew up, did you see other, like your friends or laborers, they maybe go went to different trajectories um, and in lessons that we can learn from their stories, I, I would put that way. <laughs> so th this, I guess this question is for any of the panelists. So anybody can jump in here and just kind of and address Dr. Wynn's concern. And that, it's a good, it's a good question. And, you know, good thought too, right? Because we do, like you said, have some really high impact, high quality, not that all women are high quality, but yeah, I'm going to stop talking there. And <laughs> whoever wants to address the question. I can. Um, so I'm actually a first generation college student. Um, so my, my mother um, actually is a high school dropout and she is, um, we're, she 